Good morning. morning. Welcome to Broadway First Baptist Church. It is a joy to see you all here today on this special occasion. It's a time to to share, a time to worship. There's also a service to commission our pastor, Charlene. And I will talk a little bit more about that later. And as you know that we are people who are living on, worshiping on Treaty One land. And I think as we learn yesterday, and as we are continuously to learn that we are people of reconciliation, that it is our job as people who are faith to reach out and to be reconciled to one another in peace and in love and understanding. So often we refuse, maybe not a good word, but sometimes we just do not understand the full effect on, on people's lives or the history of what people have been going through. But I do have some announcements. It is now fall. We are getting into the full swing of things once again. And we are stepping out in faith to see what God can do among us. And please, please realize that God can use a small group to do mighty works for him. So yeah, there is a few announcements. Connections deadline. Um, Get your articles, get your submissions in today by midnight. Please, please get that in so Susan can have her fun in putting together our newsletter. Next week, we are having a concert on September the 23rd at 7 p.m. Sound Foundation is coming and the concert is going to be up here in the sanctuary. Invite your friends, invite whomever. I still have little uh, pamphlets to give to you so you can hand out to your friends to invite them. It is going to be a good time. And I know this is maybe a couple weeks away, but we have decided that we want to once again do a food drive for Winnipeg Harvest. So on Thanksgiving Sunday, October the 9th, we are going to bring our offerings of food to give to Winnipeg, I mean, to Harvest. I guess it's called Manitoba Harvest now. So. Yeah, they, they changed the name, so it's Manitoba Harvest, I think, but we all know it as Harvest. And we know that through COVID, there's been a lot of things happening, and there's lots of people in need. So let's reach out and do the best we can to help others. There is a fall gathering for the ladies coming up at the Filipino Evangelical Church on October the 1st. And apparently the speaker that day is somebody named Charlene. So she would be sharing with the ladies at the Filipino Evangelical Church October the 1st from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Ladies, if you can make it, I think you will enjoy that tremendously. At least Peggy keeps telling us how wonderful it is. And Peggy, when it comes to those things, you can trust Peggy on those things, so. And I had an announcement given to me through email this morning. I'm gonna do my best to read this to you. If I change some of the words, please forgive me, but you don't know because you can't read this. Anyways. Bethlehem Aboriginal Fellowship would like to invite you, our sister church of CBWC churches, to an interactive activity called a blanket exercise. A blanket exercise is an educational tool used to help people understand the effect of colonization on the native people. It focuses on the loss of land and how it affects native people. It is an interactive but you do not have to say or do anything. It is an eye-opening experience and our hope is that you will take us, our hope is that it will take us all a little bit further along the road of reconciliation. So that is Friday, September the 30th at Bethlehem Aboriginal Church at 7 p.m. I hate having to share bad news with people. 
because and I want you to thank Sheila for giving me a note about what I was about to say. <laughs> thank you, Sheila. I hate having to give bad news, but I think you all know what I'm about to tell you. And I don't have the, the words like Bib has to express how I would feel. But we know that Carol Giesbeck has passed away this week, right? And she was one of our course director many years ago. And she was a big part of Broadway. And, you know, it's a loss to us. And as well as a loss that probably hit, for me, a bit more close to home, is the loss of Frank Gray. And, you know, we all know Frank. We love Frank. He was a person that has a really good sense of humor, easy to talk to, easy to love and to share. And he, I remember times in the kitchen with him and with him, Ruben, there's a few others. Uh, and just the fun it was to be gathered with these guys and, and just having a great time trying, trying to cook something in the kitchen. So these things that we will, you know, it's heartbreaking. But we also know the hope that is in Christ. Because scripture tells us that Christ has conquered the grave. That there will be one time that we will join together with our friends. And we do look forward to that time. So if I'm reading this right, Bib is in Victoria Hospital right now. So I, that's all I know. So we will keep praying for Bib. And Beryl is at Riverview right now. So we want to still continue to pray for her. So even though this is a sad time, it is still a time for us to gather and worship. It's still a time for us to celebrate the goodness of God because God is still good in the midst of our pain. God is still good to help us as we travel this journey of life that is very difficult at times. And we don't understand why we go through some of these pains, but we can trust God to lead us through. That through the cross of Christ, we are victorious. And it's also a time of joy as we celebrate the commissioning of Charlene. Now, as Charlene is going to come up here and she's going to say with her whole heart that she's willing to serve us faithfully with the help of God through the Holy Spirit. And it's not just a service for her, but it is a service for us as well as we pray for her, as we walk alongside her, as we say that we too will be people of faith, that we will trust the Holy Spirit to lead us and to help her and to help us to serve Christ faithfully in this place. So it's for all of us as we join together, as Charlene says that she's going to serve Christ faithfully, we are going to come alongside her and say we will help and serve faithfully as well. And I do believe with my whole heart to the working of God's Holy Spirit that he can do some wonderful things in this place and that we would trust him and that we will take our lives and just give it over to him to do some great things. And I know some good things are happening already. And one of the joys, and I don't know why I forget, forget this, whole, this most important part is that there is a lunch afterwards. And that too would be a time of gathering together and sharing. But first, let us stand together and sing and worship our Lord as we sing Him 425, I do believe. Yes. We praise you, O God, and we will stand together as we sing. We praise you, O God.
imagine this is like a listening service and there's lots of people who are taking part in this service. We are so glad to have Rachel back. She's been a big help over the last few months. And thank you, Rachel, for your ministry. Really appreciate it. And as well, John Hunt, Paul Gettle, Shola Mitchell Durick will be sharing in this time of commissioning for Charlene. And we do have a familiar face among us, somebody that I think, I do believe most of us know this person. He has been a friend of Broadway for 30 some odd years now. <laughs> he doesn't want to admit it. Yes. <laughs> Mark Dirksen, who is our area minister for the heartland of the broad, um, Baptist Churches of Western Canada. Can any Baptist Churches of Western Canada? I don't know why I'm having such a difficult time with that. But Mark is a friend of ours. And every time Mark has come up and shared with us, it's been a blessing. He's committed to serving Christ and serving our churches. So we are glad to have you, Mark. And if anybody doesn't know Mark, I say, talk to him today, corner him, and share with him. He, he is an easy person to talk to. So we're glad to have you, Mark. And I'm so looking forward to this service. I'm looking forward to what Christ is gonna do in our midst. Let's have a moment of prayer before we sing our next hymns. Father God, our Creator, our, our Redeemer, our, and our Sustainer, we thank you for this time that we can gather to worship you and to serve you. You know, Lord, as I mentioned, life is not for the faint, faint of heart. We travel this road and sometimes we experience joy, happiness, contentment, fulfillment. While other times, Lord, we do suffer pain, hurts and loss. And people tell us, yes, it's a part of life. But it's also a part of life that is very difficult to deal with. And we do remember our friends. And we thank you for Carol, who's for such a blessing on the church for so many years as our director of music. And the work that she went into um, this with Christian music and hymns. She was definitely a blessing, Lord. I mean, your hand would be upon her family as they're going through the grief, the loss of a loved one. And we also thank you for Frank Gray, who is a, such a great friend of many of us. And we will miss him, and we thank you for the time that we have had with him. Lord, we know that his family is hurting. We know that, you found that his family needs a touch from your spirit to bring comfort. And especially for Beryl, who herself is going through her own health concerns. The Holy Spirit be God of comfort to her. And Lord, we, we think of Bib. We thank you for the many years that he has shared with us in this place and his faithfulness to you. And Lord, we do know that there are others who are going through health concerns as Biff, and, and Lord, I pray that your hand, Lord, would be upon each person who is going through some difficulties at this time. Lord, if you will, bring healing, bring comfort, bring peace, Lord. And Father, help us to have a, an inner joy, an inner peace. Because despite all the things that we go through, we still know that you are in charge. 
that you are still in control. And even through those times of war, and we do think of Ukraine and the war with Russia, again, it seems so senseless and foolish. I, I know I don't understand why. I'm going to pray somehow, Lord, that through your, through your work in your spirit, that somehow peace can come. And Father, we look around this world and there's so many places that are right now that are suffering some, in some ways, whether it's floods, landslides, earthquakes, or whatever, Lord. Lord, I, can, I, I, I thank you that you know, maybe we can have a small way in helping people. Maybe you're calling us to give a donation, or maybe you're calling us to, to just give words of comfort. And Lord, may, may we be your hands. May we be your feet, Lord. And Father, for this place that we, we worship in, we thank you for this building. But most of all, we thank you for the fellowship of each one that is here, this, this body of Christ that is here today, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for the, the way we give. And sometimes, you know, we give, we give through our offerings and through our tithing. And we thank you, Lord, and we pray that those tithing and offerings that we give will be used to glorify you. But as well, Lord, I thank you for the gift of service and the gift of get, the gifts that we may have, the gift of music or the gift of giving or the gift of sharing or the gift of cleaning or any of those things, Lord, because those two are important. And may these things that we do, Lord, everything that we do, as the scriptures say, that whether we eat or what, whatever we do, we give to the glory of God. Because that's what we are here for, Lord, to give you the glory and to give you the honor that is to your name. And so, Lord, we are going to continue to worship. We're going to continue to share. We're going to pray for Charlene. We're going to pray for this church. We're going to pray, Lord, most of all, that your Holy Spirit be upon us to do the work of God through, through your Holy Spirit. And it's in Christ, and we pray. Amen. We are going to worship some more, and I, I love the singing this morning. I can hear people sing loudly and with joy, and I love that. You know, when, when people are singing with their face in the book, you can't hear them. But when you are singing as loud and joyful as you are today, it's a blessing. So we're going to stand, we're going to sing two hymns. The first is the chorus to the steadfast love of the Lord. And then we will sing, I will serve you, I will serve thee. Because we know God is merciful. We know that his love is new every day. And the reason we serve him, because he first loved us. So let's stand together as we sing.
We have two scripture readings this morning. The first one is from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. To the elders and the flock. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, Submit yourselves to your elders, all of you. Clothe yourselves in humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. The second reading is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Well, Bob, I think it is exactly 30 years uh, that we came to the church, uh, Mary and I, and we were late for our first service, so thanks for uh, reminding me of that. Uh, just an update from our family, our, uh, our son Micah has uh, moved out of the house this year and he's starting his teaching career, so uh, Micah was just, uh, just a baby, I think, when we uh, departed from here and went to St. Vitale Baptist. And our daughter was uh, engaged or uh, asked, to, uh, someone proposed to her, someone that we knew, and uh, she said yes, and so she'll be married in uh, next year or sometime. So uh, my coffee budget has decreased significantly as we save, save some money for that particular event. I think we're hoping to invite two or three people. So, I want to say too, your uh, voice recognition program here is uh, obviously uh, fantastic. Uh, if you ever pull alongside me in traffic and you see me yelling, it's because I'm yelling at Siri. Um, and so obviously this is way better than, than what happens between me and Siri in the car. So I have a, a stained glass piece from Frank Gray hanging in my office window. Thanks be to God. 
I'm uh, privileged, of course, to be here and to be with you on this celebratory occasion. I want to thank your leadership for the invitation to come and to uh, speak and take part in this service. I think it's really always exciting to have a new minister come to a congregation. I think it's important that congregations and their ministers have some sort of exchange uh, and exchange promises early in their relationship to remind each other of their intent. Of course, things don't always turn out the way that we want them to, but we at least can begin the journey together by reminding ourselves of some important theological themes, perhaps, when it comes to pastors and their congregations. Now, I'm, I'm not sure if any of you have been reading any stats on pastors lately. <laughs> and I'd be surprised if you have, because this sort of information is not usually on our must-read lists or uh, Goodreads or Twitter feeds or whatever you do. But the stats are fairly telling, I think, in terms of uh, some of the pressures that clergy face as they attempt to minister in our current context. The work of the pastor, I don't think, has ever been easy and I'd suggest that it's actually more complex in this day and age than it has been even in recent years. More and more people are hostile towards faith and have no experience of faith whatsoever. People are more and more polarized and have seemingly made up their minds about everything and they're not afraid to tell you what their minds have been made up about. And it appears too that the influence of the church that it may have had over society at some point is now waning at an alarming rate. The church, in my opinion, is headed back to the margins where it originated, but it's hard for us to know how to get there and what that will look like, and that is accompanied sometimes by grief, because things aren't as they used to be. That's not to say that everything is lost. I believe the New Testament church was at the margins to begin with, and we have to relearn what that means. It's challenging, but it is not without hope. And of course, some of the main players in terms of communities of faith and their existence in the dominant culture of the day are pastors and the congregations that they serve. And I'd like to speak a few words to each of these parties, reminding us all that each of us have responsibilities as we attempt to be the church today. So one of my responsibilities within the denomination is to think a little bit about clergy wellness. So some of my reading has related to this particular topic. And the Barna Group is a, a group that has released a book a few years ago now called The State of Pastors. And the premise of the book is that the Christian community does not need stronger leaders, but in fact we need more resilient ones. And here are some of the stats that they cite to make their case. So as a cohort, if you think about pastors in general, as a cohort of pastors and leaders, pastors are getting older. It is not uncommon for spiritual leaders to face significant doubt. One in three pastors is at the risk of burnout, and I would say that's increased since COVID. Nearly half of pastors face some sort of serious relational risk. This includes challenges to marriage, family, friendships, or other relationships. Pastors are not immune to uh, mental health struggles. There are, of course, some good news in these stats that I haven't shared with you, but I want to emphasize these for now, that there are some real concerns about pastoral work. And I think it's compounded in pastoral ministry because there's a tendency sometimes to place pastors on some sort of pedestal, thinking that at least they should have their lives together as they minister to us. Pastors too find it difficult to go for help if necessary because they feel the pressure of having their lives together. And if you were living in some sort of bubble that suggested that pastors are just one notch below Jesus Christ himself, well then I'm sorry that I've broken that uh, particular conception for you. Of course, the inner life, the spiritual life of pastors is also at risk for pastors, and we have to be careful about this. And I refer, refer now to the work of Henry Nouwen, a writer who spent a great deal of time focusing on the spiritual life and practices of people in ministry. Way back in 1981, before I got here, Nouwen wrote that there are two main enemies to the spiritual life, especially for pastors. Those enemies are anger and greed. Now it suggests that pastors are angry at their leaders for not leading and, uh, and at their followers for not following. They are angry at those who do not come to church for not coming, and they're angry at those who do come to church because they don't have enough enthusiasm. And in terms of greed, we all know that the pastoral life is not the most lucrative, and so greed flares up when desire is frustrated. A more recent theologian by the name of Stanley Harawas also suggests 
also has some concerns for and for pastors these days. He suggests that ministry is rather like being nibbled to death by ducks. Further, loneliness is a real occupational hazard for pastors because it's difficult to find deep friendship in churches that they lead. And finally, he suggests that our motives for ministry are incredibly important. If we're in ministry as pastors for accomplishment or achievement or identity, we're in a lot of trouble. I hope by now you're thinking that I might eventually have some words of encouragement for the role of a pastor, since this is, after all, a commissioning service. And I do. And not surprisingly, the words of encouragement, the words of resilience to sustain pastors in ministry are found in the scriptures. In the New Testament, especially the first New Testament passage that we read this morning, 1 Peter 5, 1 to 11. So I'd ask that you would follow along in your Bibles uh, to the first passage that Susan read for us this morning. I'm not going to go into all the details of this passage, but I do want to highlight some important concepts within the passage that might serve as an encouragement to you, Charlene, as you begin your ministry here. In my opinion, when I read this passage, I can't help but see Peter's own life as a backdrop to his writings, as we should, I think. For example, in John 21, all Peter wants to do is go fishing, right? But Jesus shows up on the shore, and then he asks Peter more than once, do you love me? Jesus responds, then feed my sheep. So we're not surprised, I don't think, in this passage to hear themes like flock and shepherd and the like because Peter had heard those words spoken to him by the Lord himself. So here then are some ideas from the text that are important for pastoral ministry. And from the outset, Peter calls himself a fellow elder. And actually, this is a betrayal of his posture as he writes or his position as he writes. I think it's a term cloaked in humility Peter, you remember, had the legit resume of an apostle as one of the original 12. He doesn't refer to himself as such, right? He doesn't play that card. Instead, he includes himself generally in the leadership of that particular church. And as a, such a leader, one on the same level ground as other church leaders, he appeals to his fellow leaders to care for those under their care. And in the verses following this phrase, I think there are four themes for us to consider quickly this morning. First, Peter says, watch over your charge willingly, but not grudgingly. Of course, there are going to be days, Charlene, when you are going to wake up and the last thing you're going to want to do is, want to, is, is to head over to the church to work on a sermon or to help people through some relational turmoil. Those days should be the exception. The call is to serve willingly, to grow in your calling, in your skills, in your relationships, in your love for the Lord, so that you are better equipped to minister to folks who open up their lives to you in ways that simply are often not replicated elsewhere. Second, and I wish this sentence wasn't there, but Peter says, lead the people in your charge by your own good example. This language is annoyingly close to what Paul says when he says that people ought to imitate him as he followed Christ. The point, of course, is that Peter doesn't want you to lord it over your people. Don't assume that people will do what you want them to do just because you're their pastor. And of course, do no harm to people using your role as some sort of authoritarian position. That's not how it works. Don't be tempted by it. The third idea from our passage today for pastoral work comes at verse 5, where Peter talks about serving others in humility. Perhaps there is no better time in history to talk about humility than in our day and age. We talk to our children as though they can do anything when they grow up, and I think we all know by now that that is a bald-faced lie. We present our best selves to the world via Facebook, and in the meantime, our personal worlds are crashing down around us. We seek followers on Twitter and Instagram because that seems to help with our self-esteem and show others that, hey, we're better than you somehow. How about we push pause on that and instead relate to others with humility? Share what's appropriate about ourselves, admit it when we don't have the answers, admit our own struggles, and seek help, for crying out loud, when we need it. For starters, of course, that too is an example for those that we serve. And this can be difficult for pastors because people often look to us for guidance. In any event, Peter reminds you to let humility lead in your ministry, Charlene. As one pastor has said, if the brokenness of people feels like some sort of intrusion, like an obstacle for our important work for God, like preaching and teaching, then we've got some work to do in terms of refashioning our desires, revisiting humility, 
for our own contexts. And the final piece from this passage that I wanted to reflect on uh, for the pastor, at least, comes to us from verse 8. Peter says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. And again, I can't help but think of Peter's own personal life. His intentions, I don't think, were to deny Christ in his most significant moment of need. But that's what happened, and I'm sure that Peter was influenced by the Prince of Darkness at that particular time. And I think Peter's right. We are tempted by different things in ministry. And if we're not careful, we succumb to the schemes of the evil one. We combat this, on the other hand, by intentionality, by speaking with trusted friends, by prayer, to name a few. Of course, Charlene, this is not exhaustive, but the trajectory of these ideas, I think, is unmistakable. So take proper care of yourself, Charlene, so that you can love these people and care for them. Marry them, bury them, walk with them, encourage them, speak directly and prophetically to them when they need to, when you need to, and help them to move further into what God has for them as individuals, as a community of faith. Rejoice with them when they rejoice and be with them through their hours of need. You are in a privileged spot, Charlene, and I pray you understand how fragile and sacred and potentially powerful that is all at the same time. Now, just as some of you as part of the congregation were thinking that this is all on her, I would like to follow the themes of the promises we will make this morning and spend a bit of time reviewing some of the instructions for our congregations. There are lots of passages that have instructions for congregations. You've read them, I'm sure. But I'd like for us to consider just a short passage from Paul's letter to the Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17, the second passage that Susan read for us this morning. Now I'd like to start by reiterating something that seems fairly clear from a reading of the New Testament. People are watching those who are part of churches. As the church becomes the community that Christ wants it to be, people are attracted to it. The church, as it worships and serves corporately, as it loves each other, is a significant witness to the watching world. As the church becomes the community that Christ wants it to be, as they point to what God has done and is doing, people are attracted to it. So here again, we are challenged to be certain kinds of people. We are to engage others, to treat each other in certain ways, to be the kind of community that Christ died for. This all includes all sorts of aspects of what it means to be human. Paul, in verses 5 to 11 of Colossians 3, writes about a faithful person's sexuality, speech, idolatry, and greed. And our baptism demands a life of obedience and character formation, at least as a start. Live into and embody your baptism and into what you profess, folks. And Paul's challenge to the Colossians church in our passage then was for them, the congregation, to be God's holy people. God has shown grace to creation and his creatures by choosing them, making them holy, and loving them, and a life of worship and gratitude is expected of those who respond favorably to his grace. So Paul's biggest challenge comes to the community in terms of how they actually relate to each other. This is where the rubber hits the road. This too is often submersive compared to dominant culture, and as a result, I think, uh, bears repeating here. Paul writes to those who are part of congregations so that speech and behavior uh, to the other are actually important. And I think he would write to this congregation today the same as he wrote to the Colossians so many years ago. So, Broadway First Baptist Church, clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults, forgive each other, lead with love, let the peace that comes from Christ rule your hearts. Let the richness of the message of Christ permeate your community, guide each other, and be open to each other's guidance. Remember that you are a representative of Jesus Christ and suitably for this occasion. Always give thanks to him through God the Father. Now I want to be clear that this is something we need to work at, especially if the New Testament churches are a model for us. Take the church at Corinth. There was a bunch of junk going on there. And yet Paul would want them to return from these things and instead to be the community that God called them to be. Similarly, as our society values self-assertiveness and arrogance, Paul reminds congregations to, uh, or of humility, a theme that we've already talked about, and gentleness, and about being concerned for the person sitting beside you in your pew. In a community of faith, we make concessions for each other because we care for each other, and we're part of uh, something that's bigger than ourselves. And related, 
I think humility is required of us all as we adjust to each other. Charlene will have perspectives for this community that will be new, and one factor that will help with transition is a willingness on behalf of the congregation to hear new things and to try them, to be dedicated to a deepening discipleship. As Eugene Peterson once wrote, pastors want to help Christians live their lives Christianly. The enduring question for congregants is, will you let her? Shared promises today remind us that communities of faith, as well as pastors, have responsibilities in living life together, in being the church together, and take heart, the watching world notices when we relate to each other in these sorts of ways. I congratulate you on your continued witness in this community, on welcoming a new pastor and her family. Charlene and Hanny, we recognize the adjustments you've had to make in settling here and to serve this congregation. And I think it's something that we can all be thankful for. May humility be your trademark as you minister here. We also want to recognize that this congregation has called you. We pray that they too, in humility, might support you in your work and that they would continue to learn to treat each other as the redeemed people of God. We recognize, too, the role of the Holy Spirit in making this relationship flourish. And I pray that as you trust for, I pray that as your trust for each other grows, that together you would grow in our apprenticeship to Jesus and also accomplish great things for God as a community right here in Winnipeg. Amen. We're going to transition now to the, I guess, the formal exchange of commitments between the pastor and the congregation. And uh, I think there's going to be some um, liturgy on the screen here. Uh, and officially, uh, there's going to be uh, the, the heading of moderator on there. So I will act as the moderator for this particular piece. And uh, the congregation will be asked to participate. And there's been a few people who have been asked to also say a few words, and I will call them up shortly here. So formally, we are gathered together in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the head of the church, to commission Charlene McAlpin to the ministry of Broadway First Baptist Church. And as we begin this exchange of commitment, commitments, I would ask that representatives from the church come forward, John, I think Paul, and Sheila, and then Charlene as well, and tell us the narrative of how this match actually came to be. Sometimes you have to have faith. I want to look at the battery on this thing, and I can't see where it, where it is, but I think it's all good. So. so I've been asked to come up here to talk about the early days in, our, um, in the start of our relationship with Charlene. So... Uh, I got thinking about this, I, I tend to maybe over-prepare and write a lot of notes, and I wasn't able to do that this weekend. I had a fair, bit, fair number of things going on, and I did a lot of thinking. I was in the basement this morning, or last night, and I started to get a little bit emotional. And, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, just, just thinking about where we were. And I think part of the reason for that was uh, reflecting on Frank Gray. And it just started a, 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 tr a train of thought here. That I'm, and I asked Sheila how long I, how long she wanted it to be here, and she said, "Well, one, maybe two minutes." And I think she was trying to make my life easier, but she also said, "I can go longer, and I'm going to go on the longer side." So, um, so as I was thinking about Frank, and then and then we hear about Carol Breesburg too, and. and and I always think about this little saying, you know, we, we lose good people every day. And we also gain people. And we were heading home after the, uh, after the breakfast this morning, or yesterday, and um, Amy had with her a little shopping bag full of uh, tea towels from the kitchen. And she was going to take them home and wash them. And I thought, well, wait a minute, that's, that's Sheila Reese. Sheila Reese did that. And then I started thinking about Harvey and Ruth. That's kind of Joyce and Lee, isn't it? You know, they just kind of show up and they did things. And that was what was happening with, with Lee and Joyce. And um, Sheila. Sheila, you're kind of like, uh, you're kind of like Carol Barber. <laughs> right? Like our last female uh, chair of deacons was Carol. And now here you are. 
Bob Griffith. You mentioned him today, but isn't it interesting that uh, Bob can be a lot like Viv? He does so much. And he maybe says he doesn't do it as well, and we all probably think we don't do it as well, but Bob, you're kind of like a new Viv. How about Barbara Lyons in the office? That's a lot like Linda Dick. And we have, um, we, I think we have more of those. So, although I'm grateful for the people we've lost, I'm grateful for the, their lives and their time with us here, I'm also thankful for, for those we have. And all that started actually as an intro because I was starting to, uh, off to think about thankfulness. And I wanted to take this opportunity to thank Mark Dirk. Now, this day is not about Mark, but um, Mark hasn't been appropriately thanked for a few things that have happened in the past. And I've had the opportunity to do that, and I missed it. And I realized afterward that I missed those opportunities. So I'm going to take it today. So, 10 years ago, when Mark was at Willow Lake, We were pastors. We were pastorless at this one point in time, and I was the chair of deacons. And uh, Bill Nickerson's health started failing rapidly, and it became very clear that he was in his final days. And I was getting inundated with phone calls for something that I wasn't qualified to do, which was help Bill through his last time, you know, support to the family. I just didn't know what to do. moment, please. Uh, so I phoned up Mark, told him what was happening. I said, is there anybody in the CBWC that can help us through that? Mark said, do you want me to call um, Peter and Vivian? He did it. No problem. Taken care of. Thank you, Mark. Then after we had a pastor, we had Joe. And those two had kind of a special relationship. What, what were you? Were you Joe's advisor? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> they were partners in crime. So those were good days. Uh, again, uh, I'll take you back to uh, a couple of years ago when we were um, pastorless again, and I, I reached out to Mark. Mark, is the, the CBWC have a list of speakers that can help us through this time? Bam, there was the list. Um, over the last two years, Mark has been with us four Sundays where he led us and he led us uh, through Zoom and he led us live. And uh, do you remember those days in Zoom? He had that annoying backdrop. There was a little John Deere green John Deere tractor, that annoying, <laughs> annoying little thing that he had back there. There was meetings for coffee. We met at the, at the Forks and then there was those walks on the frozen Seine River, Mark. So, uh, that was time for uh, Chair of Deacon's Council and, and some good times that we had together. And it was one place that uh, Mark helped me scratch the itch of one of my favorite mysterious uh, topics, which is what was going on outside the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were inside? Because there was something happening outside those walls, and uh, we talked about that a little bit. So anyway, thank you, Mark. So now I want to take you back to 2020. April 26th was Joe Welty's last day with us. And there was, a, again, you know, these were strange times. We'd started into COVID, so the early days of COVID, we had recordings that were happening up top there, and, and those were days of mystery. We didn't know what was ahead of us. May 3rd, Mark Dirksen led us as we started on a journey that was gonna last us 27 weeks where we had all internal speakers. We were working through the transition of Joe was still on salary, he was still on staff, he was working for what was next with him, and we were, we were doing the same thing, trying to figure out where, how we were going to go forward. And that was all internal speakers. I won't name them here, I would like to, but uh, I won't name them all. Uh, November 8th, we started, November 8th of 2020, we started into the introduction of external speakers. And, uh, November 22nd, so two weeks after that first one, Charlene was the first time with us. And we noticed, some of us, that there was something different about Charlene. And 
I remember thinking that I was surprised that there was somebody like that out there, and I'm glad you were. So in 2021, early 2021, uh, when I got a hold of Charlene, she actually made a nice proposal to me, which was, how about a series of three Sundays? I'll, I'll come up with three, three Sundays here, we'll, we'll do three sermons, and they went, went Mar February, March, and April. You know, and for a guy who's always looking for external speakers, that was quite a gap to fill. So we started something very good there. And then sometime during that, I've, I don't hope I'm not going to repeat something you said. This is kind of, I thought this was sort of top secret at the time, but Sheila and I were, sometime during this February, March, and April time, we were heading down the back stairs, and we were both stayed kind of late. And uh, we ran into each other, and, and, and I can say this now because we were never on the pastoral search committee. We never talked about it afterward, and I don't think it came up afterward, but we said, and I think... I'm going, to, I'm going to blame it on you. You said right off the bat, wouldn't she make a great part-time pastor? She had a full-time job. That was just a hypothetical comment, I think. Remember that day? <laughs> so overall, 12 Sundays. Um, Charlene never said no to me. There was a couple times when she wasn't available, but she came back immediately. She said... Um, uh, I've really enjoyed my services with you, and I can't do that day, but here is my availability. So, that's kind of what led us to today, or part of it anyway, and thank you for my time up here and, and getting to share this with you, because two years goes by fairly quick, and I'm excited to be here today. Thanks, John. You're, you're a tough act to follow. <laughs> My name is Paul Gittle, and I served on the Pastoral Search Committee. Your Pastoral Search Committee was most ably chaired and led by Richard Billings. And it included Carol Barber, Bob Griffin, and Peggy Talbot. We were also ably assisted in our efforts with communication from Mark Dirksen and advice. It was very helpful, and we're very grateful for for that. A unique change was all of our meetings were held on Zoom and over much time. And eventually our interview of Charlene McAlpin was also via Zoom. We were at an advantage though as we had previous experience from when Charlene had been a guest speaker at Broadway on several occasions, and John Hunt has now explained how that came about. The rest is, as you now know, history. It was a challenging time on the Pastoral Search Committee. We came together with different perspectives and different outlooks, but wanting to remember that common ground at the foot of the cross. And there were times that we didn't always agree with things in how questions were going to be formulated. But as in life, we recognize that conflict is inevitable. It need not be a negative thing. And with the Pastoral Church Committee, I believe that it became a constructive thing as we worked together and worked through some issues prior to that interview that we had with Charlene. Charlene is now employed as our part-time pastor. We've heard her Bible-based teachings, and I am very much encouraged by them. Charlene is coming to us with a biblical back message of grace and truth. And that grace and truth is for all to hear. Charlene knows the gospel is for all persons, regardless of how their inherent sin nature has expressed itself and offended a holy God. A God who is Charlene's God as her Lord and Savior, and one whose word she delights to proclaim, to share, to live out, and to delight in, in so rich a salvation that has its recipients heaven-bound. 
We have that assurance for Carol Ginsburg and Frank Gray. And so we grieve, but not without hope. Charlene is a full-time wife, mother, grandmother, a full-time employee in the secular world, where she puts her faith to work, where she works. And while Charlene is employed as a part-time pastor here at Broadway, we know she is a full-time Christian and our sister in Christ among all who are part of this fellowship and the wider body of Christ, his church the world over. We welcome you in Hani and look forward to our fellowship with you in both the journey Broadway is on and that each of us is on together with you and with each other. It has been my pleasure to welcome Charlene to our board as the chair of deacons, me who has always been finance. And so I am walking a very different path, enjoying getting to know Charlene and getting to know that side of Broadway First Baptist Church. A little aside comment, and I was mentioning it the other day, um, we had an unfortunate incident on Zoom a couple of years back. And so I became a little bit more vigilant on the Zoom participants. And so anytime there was someone different, I thought, you know, I'm going to reach out to them. So here was this Hani Khalidi, and I thought, who is that? So I went searching Facebook, no, ah, LinkedIn. So I messaged him and said, welcome, glad you could join us this morning for church. And he said, oh, I'm Charlene's husband. <laughs> so, glad, glad that you joined and glad that I got to meet you that way. In 1998, very loud, in 1998, uh, there were two women, two graduates at the Hartford, Sem Hartford Seminary, who gave birth to a ministry, a program of compassion and love, knitting and crocheting in a prayerful ministry. Whether they're called prayer shawls, comfort shawls, Peace shawls. The shawl maker begins with prayers and blessings for the recipient. John, you are like me. <laughs> the intentions are continued throughout the creation of the shawl. Upon completion, a final blessing is offered before the shawl is sent on its way. Shawls have been made for centuries, universal and embracing, symbolic of an inclusive, unconditionally loving God. They wrap, enfold, comfort, cover, give solace, mother, hug, shelter, and beautify. Those who have received these shawls have been uplifted and affirmed as if given wings to fly about their troubles. We thank Susan for allowing us you with your own prayer shawl. Mm -hmm. May you feel God's warmth and embrace as you minister to us. this church. I have always felt very honored and privileged to be a part of this community and that 
this journey that you've heard about finding me and about God placing me here for you is I am so honored again to be a part of that plan and I, I pray that God will continue to work through me and through each of you as we build his church, as we share his love. And I am, I did not expect this. And I thank you so much for all your support and encouragement throughout this time. And I look forward to a long and wonderful relationship building with all of you and with all of us in God. Not sure I can speak. <laughs> Needless to say, I'm very proud to be here. I'll just hold my wife. I have no words. Thank you. We, as we uh, come to our formal exchange, we'll just wait for the words to come up on the. There we are. Charlene, it is our belief that the calling into the Christian ministry and to particular service within it is both of God and the Church. It is an inward leading and an outward calling answering to each other. Are you persuaded that you are truly called to this particular ministry to seek to fulfill the purposes of God amongst the people of Broadway First Baptist Church? I am so persuaded. People of Broadway First Baptist Church, are you persuaded that Charlene is the person whom God has brought at this time and into this place to be a pastor among you and a leader in your ministry? Will you please indicate your positive response by standing if you are able? I ask you to follow along on the screen here. Because you, Charlene, and you, the people of this church, are the ones who are giving yourselves to share ministry in this congregation and community, we invite you to respond to each other. We believe that you, Charlene, are the person intended by God to be a pastor among us and a leader in our ministry. It is in this belief that we have called you to our fellowship. And it is in this belief that we now affirm our invitation to you. I believe that you, the congregation of Broadway First Baptist Church, are the people among whom I am intended by God to live, to serve as pastor, and to share with in ministry. It is in this belief that I have accepted the call to your fellowship, and it is in this belief that I now affirm my acceptance of your invitation. We ask you, Charlene, will you minister to us using the gifts God has entrusted to you? Will you give of yourself by the strength and grace of Jesus Christ our Lord? Will you be sensitive to the needs and possibilities of all of our people? young and old, singly or in families, those new to our congregation and those long affiliated with it. Will you help us to grow toward Christian maturity through your preaching and teaching, your example and counsel? Will you encourage us to love and serve one another? Will you help us to communicate the good news of Jesus Christ to the people of our community and our world. Will you enable 
Christ to be an effective part of the heartland region of Baptist churches and the Canadian Baptists of Western Canada. To all of these questions I affirm, with Christ as my helper, I will try to do all of these things. Now, I ask for a pledge of your encouragement and support. Do you understand yourselves to be sharing Christ's ministry with me in the fellowship of this congregation? Will you be sensitive to my needs and the needs of my family and seek to minister to me as well as with me? Will you assure me of your confidence, your encouragement, your patience and your prayers? And finally, will you commit yourselves to the tasks which will give shape and energy to our ministry in this place? To all, all these questions, questions we affirm, with Christ's help, we will try to do all of these things. We accept you, Charlene, as a person of Christian commitment and God-given gifts. We accept you as a pastor among us and a leader in our ministry. I accept you, the people of this congregation, as people of Christian commitment and God-given gifts. I accept you as the people God has called me to serve and as co-workers in our ministry together. We who are here as friends and neighbors of this congregation have witnessed and witnessed the promises you have made to each other and as a, an expression of our support to declare our joy and confidence in your coming together and to commit ourselves to you in the ministry we share we will momentarily uh, pray for you uh, commissioning prayer and so formally charlene in the name of jesus christ our lord and on behalf of the heartland region of baptist churches and with the authority given to me by this uh, congregation, I declare you to be the pastor of this church. May the Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. The Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen. And since no one, no one person or group of people is sufficient for the commitments made today, let us call upon God in prayer. And I'm going to ask uh, Charlene and Annie to go uh, down at first. And if you'd like to surround them and we will pray for them uh, together. Everyone is welcome to come into this area as we pray with Charlene. Yeah, some would like to um, extend their hands towards Charlene or to uh, place your hand upon her and her and fantastic. So. celebrate together in this event, we are so pleased that you call people to ministry still, and um, we thank you for the call that you've placed on Charlene's life, and we're reminded, of course, of all the support that was necessary to get her um, education for this, and her experiences in ministry, and all sorts of things, as we've um, heard from Hani, and we know that there's lots that have gone into this, and we are grateful for the sacrifices that they've made, and uh, the um, education that they've received, and the mentorships that they've received, and so on and so forth, to make this day a reality. We ask that for a continued deepening of Charlene's faith, and for wisdom that only you can provide, so that she would have um, a correct response, in the correct moment. And I pray that she would always be encouraged looking back on this day, reminded of her call in you. And I too thank you that this work is both internal and also externally confirmed. And for this congregation, we give thanks and we're thankful for the words shared here today and for the way that you've been working in behind the scenes maybe and not so not always so behind the scenes, but also up front. As you work through this congregation, you call her. And as we've heard today, there's um, 
some grief in the congregation. We ask for your spirit to minister amongst them. Pray to that show you would know how to minister to folks when they are going through and, and to your congregation as they go through these sorts of things. And we pray to you as we look to the future that you would be faithful, that they would be faithful, that Charlene would be faithful, and that uh, you would surprise them. You ask that, uh, that the work of their hands would flourish together. Again, we're grateful for this day and for your work amongst us. Through Christ we pray these things. Amen. As we go back to our seats, I think we are going to sing the ducks all of you together once we arrive there. into the congregation as a member of Broadway First Baptist. This was not on our bulletin and, and my error. Charlene, as our pastor, as a, a woman, Christian woman, may I welcome you, extend the right hand of fellowship to our church. And another little gift that we have has been created in order for you to know where you live. <laughs> so we provide you this little gift um, where we will know where you are. I have a card that will be downstairs. I would ask all of you to sign this as a remembrance of this day when we welcome Charlene into fellowship as well as Charlene as our pastor. And we have one last hymn. I heard the voice of Jesus say, number 671 in the Book of Praise.
benediction from 2 Corinthians 13, verse 13. Now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us go in peace. Our worship is ended. Our service begins. <laughs>